Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peter Koch, and I'm here representing the BioPython project. Um, that's me on Twitter, and BioPython is also on Twitter as well. So this is a quick table of contents. I'm going to introduce BioPython, tell you about our contributors and releases this past year, how we're getting on with dual licensing, which ties into some of the earlier talks in this meeting, uh, major work on documentation and further automation, ongoing and planned work, and community building. And that's why this talk has ended up in this session, because it could easily have fitted elsewhere. But juggling talks for conferences is a tricky thing for the chairs. So BioPython is a collection of modules for biological computation in, in Python. We do sequence handling, motifs, various passes, help with database queries, protein structures, phylogenetics, command line tool wrappers, and more. And as Nomi alluded to in her introduction, it started in 1999. First release was in the year 2000, which is when the first BOSC was. And I came to it maybe five years after that. Um, it's open source. It's freely available. And it's under a particular BioPython unique license, which I'll come back to. Our web page is biopython.org. That links to our GitHub. Um, this is our new logo from about two years ago, actually a community contribution from Patrick, who gave a talk yesterday. So probably the most important slide in the talk. We've had 38 named contributors in the last year, 16 of which are new contributors. Those are the stars. This is slightly down on the numbers from last year, but broadly in line. So we started a policy of actively asking all new contributors, would you like to have your name added? And it's one of our checklists when you submit a pull request. So the recent releases, um, we've had just two releases. So we've slipped to about a six monthly cycle, whereas a couple of years back, we were doing every three months or so. One major milestone here, as of the latest release earlier this month, we finally have full API doc string coverage. So in Python, a doc string is text that's embedded into the function definition that is user-facing documentation. It tells you what that function or that class should do. So we have an old cult base. Uh, we've been improving it over the years. And finally, all the public classes and methods have got doc string coverage. Special mention to Sergio, who was the man that helped push that over the edge. So most of the code changes of the last year have actually been API documentation, Python coding style, and dual licensing changes on top of the usual bug fixes and so on. I mentioned there we've had no consensus on adopting the black Python formatting style. Something I mentioned in the abstract, we've been discussing this. Anyone in the room write a lot of Python and heard of black? A few hands going up. So everyone writes Python a little bit differently. There are standard conventions that lay down some of the rules you should follow, but black goes one step further, and it's opinionated. But it's a tool that will reformat your code. So not everyone likes the style. Probably no one completely likes the style except the authors. But if you agree to use black, you just run the tool, and that settles all the coding style arguments. So there is an attraction there for a large code base and simplifying things. But not everyone likes the style. So I touched on this in the introduction. Our open source license is, unfortunately, unique and not quite on the OSI, the Open Source Initiative's website list of approved open source licenses. It's a slight variant of a license that they do have on their list, a historic disclaimer, which was quite current when BioPython started. Um, but as we've heard earlier in this meeting, life goes on a lot more smoothly when you're using a standard license because you don't have to ask your lawyers at the department to, to read it. It's already on their pre-approved list. So we started dual licensing under the three-clause BSD license, which was, we thought, the most similar of the standard licenses to what we already had. And we've been going over all the code over the last two years and checking when we have contributors' permission to dual license each thing file by file. And we are now 50% through the main code, best, main code base. It's going to take a real while longer yet. So new projects. Pick a standard license. Pick it as early as possible. <laughs> documentation. This is probably the, the main theme of my talk. We've got documentation in three pages, uh, three places. And unfortunately, it's written in three different markup languages. So the documentation on the website was originally done in MediaWiki, which we then converted to GitHub pages using Markdown. Who in the room knows and uses Markdown? Pretty much everyone, because it's the default language on GitHub. So when you file an issue, you can use italics or whatever. That's Markdown, a slight flavor of Markdown. Our tutorial and cookbook is written in something called LaTeX. I'm expecting a smaller show of hands. Who has known or used LaTeX? Whoa, that's about the same. I'm impressed. Clearly. A quite technical audience. 
And finally, our API documentation is written in something called restructured text, which is a markup language specific to the Python community. It's like Markdown, but a bit more capable and better suited to more complicated documents. Who in the audience knows and uses RST? Slightly down, but not that different. OK. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> OK, whose favorite markup of those three is Markdown? That's a lot. Whose favorite of those three is LaTeX? <laughs> I think that was one, maybe two hands. Whose favorite of those three is RST? Uh, slightly higher, maybe six. I put myself in that camp. Markdown is really good, but it's simple. And for more complicated documentation, I think RST strikes a nice balance. So we picked on RST for our HTML, sorry, for our API documentation, which we then would turn into HTML web pages that people could view in their browser. And we used to use a tool called epydoc, which has not been updated in years. We standardized on the RC markup, which epydoc supports, in part because the most widely used documentation tool in the Python, Python ecosystem, which is Sphinx, supports RST. And we're now building our API documentation with the Sphinx tool called apidoc. Now some quick screenshots. That's our main web page. That's using uh, Jekyll Hyde on GitHub pages with Markdown behind the scenes. This is the old API documentation pages in epidoc's HTML output. It's plain but functional. It uses frames, if anyone remembers that from the early days of HTML. This is the new documentation using Sphinx API doc, visually much slicker. Um, we're still getting to grips with how it looks and there'll be a little bit of fine tuning, but the content is the same. It just looks nicer and there's search built in. And hopefully most of you will prefer that. The big win though, Oh, one more slide. A, a sneak preview. This is something I'm hoping to, to work on further at the CoFest that follows the BOSC and ISMB meeting, which is converting our LaTeX tutorial into restructured text and building that with the API docs all in one web page using Sphinx. And it looks quite nice. There are still a few rough edges on the conversion, but it's, it's nearly there. So the big win for me for moving to Sphinx was the automation. A epidoc is still a bit tricky to install. It's old and not so loved anymore. Uh, LaTeX is a real pain to install. It's got a vast amount of stuff that will get compiled from source. Anyone using Circle CI? I learned recently the, the HTS spec people are running a Circle CI instance with LaTeX on it to build their documentation, and they do continuous integration of their documentation. So we could do that, but I think we'll move to RST instead. We've been running Sphinx to do our API docs for a couple of years. It now automatically deploys to our website using GitHub pages. So that's done with a, an SSH deploy key. Um, automation has really helped. So we've been doing continuous integration testing for years. Um, and lately, oh yeah, two years now, we've been building our wheels. This is the compiled versions of BioPython that go up to the Python packaging index. So those run on AppFair and Travis, that gets us Windows, um, Mac, and Linux. So all the big platforms, we build the wheels. You can just download, run Python really, really quickly. And it's on Conda Forge as well, and that's automated too. Uh, we test on various versions of Python. We're about to drop Python 2 support in line with the community. Uh, our final release will be early 2020 to support Python 2. And then we can do another round of code cleanup. Um, ongoing work. My interest right now is simplifying the release process. I want to hand this over to someone else to be able to just run it and have it not take up a day, which sometimes it can at the minute. Further improvements in our documentation and style to better match the Python community. Those standards have evolved over the lifetime that BioPython's existed, including adopting PyDoc, NumPyDoc style for doc strings. Another project we would love to have more help on is improving the code coverage. That's static at about 85% of the non-online code for a couple of years now. Another ongoing project, we're going to try and simplify the alphabet objects, which date back to the very early days of BioPython. Uh, I mentioned dropping Python 2 support. But to be fair, most of what will happen in the next year is going to be community-driven, based on what our contributors come forward with. I was going to talk about what we're doing to help uh, draw in new contributors, like pull request templates, issue templates, easy tag fixes on your issues. You want to make it easy as possible for a new contributor to find something that they can work on and make their first contribution. Um, we've already discussed during this meeting that we're going to try and have a code of conduct, uh, not just for BioPython, but for all the BioStar projects underneath the Open BioFantasy Foundation. And I'd like you guys to tell me what else should we be doing. 
Uh, final acknowledgement slides. I've mentioned our contributors. Thank you, everybody. Uh, most of them get funded indirectly. I don't think anyone is paid directly to work on BioPython. So employers, or PhD students, we're doing this on the side. Thank you, Google Summer of Code, for past students. We haven't had any recently. I hope we will again. And the Bioinformatics Foundation for hosting our domain names, mailing lists, and that sort of thing. Thank you all.